press the button. All right. That was, that was user error. It's my bad. Um, hey, so welcome back to uh, our, our talk track for this morning, uh, day two. Uh, we're, we're kicking today off uh, talking about um, DIY uh, and pay quality. Uh, much like the pay talk stuff that we're doing later on today, uh, we wanna we feel like it's a topic that uh, is kind of taboo to talk about, uh, but I think it's something important that you know we all need to uh, get inspiration from and um, you know just ideas and stuff uh, like that from that. Um, with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Giselle, uh, who will take us away. Hey, y'all, can you hear me? Yes, you can. All right. So my name is Giselle Valenzuela Aldridge. I am the founder and principal consultant at Colossians Consulting. We provide data analytics, visualization, and data science solutions to e-commerce companies. And if you're here, you're here to listen to the DIY pay equity talk, how women and other underrepresented folks can make the same money as the majority in tech. But if you're not, and you're in the wrong room, I think you should stay, because you might end up making some more money by the end of this talk. Or at least learn how to make more money. So before I get into the origin story of this talk, I should mention that this is not your usual diversity and inclusion talk. Even though pay equity is a big topic within the diversity and inclusion umbrella. And I say this because when I go to different diversity and inclusion talks, what ends up happening is the speaker presents the problem very clearly, and it's a problem that affects me and other people like me in tech very deeply. However, what ends up happening is by the end of the talk, I end up feeling angry and frustrated and because of the feelings of powerlessness that I get during the talk. What ends up happening is that most of these talks don't provide any kind of a solution, thereby giving the problem an air of, oh, there's no solution to this problem, we just don't know what to do. Or you get a solution that has to do with agencies that have nothing to do with me and I have no power or influence over. For instance, the government or companies across the United States. By the end of this talk, you're not going to feel that way, and here's why. Because by the end of this talk, I'm going to give you tools and strategies that you can use yourself to resolve any, number one, to discover any pay gaps that you may have, and then to close those pay gaps yourself. So with that said, let's, let's go ahead and start the talk. So regarding the origin story of this talk, this is me. I'm about to graduate from Florida State with my computer science degree in this picture. And I can't tell you exactly what I'm thinking about, because I'm looking very pensive, right? But what I can tell you that I'm not thinking about, the one thing that I know for sure I'm not thinking about, is salary negotiation. Now, why is that? Because at that time, salary negotiation was just not a part of something that I thought about at all. In fact, that wouldn't be the case for a good good long time in my career. See, I thought that tech was a meritocracy and that if I worked hard, if I distinguished myself within my field, that I would be compensated financially in that, according to that manner without having to ask my employer to do so. Flash forward 10 years after graduation, and at that point I'm a senior developer at a Fortune 500 company and at that point is when I realized that tech is actually not a meritocracy, it's a business. And just like in any other business, employers want to pay as little as possible for their employees. So while I was not negotiating pay during that whole time, other engineers were negotiating pay since day one. I just didn't know about it. So I was shocked to find out in this point in my career that I was getting paid $10,000 less than other senior developers within my same company in the same geographical area. I discovered 
that I had a pay gap at that point in time. So what is a pay gap? So quite simply, a pay gap is the difference between your market value and your actual pay. Your market value can be determined using three major factors. One is your education level. One is your number of years of experience in tech. And the most important part is your current skill set and how in demand your skills are. So how does a pay gap start? Well, how did I find out about my own pay gap? I can't really get into the details of how I found out. I had someone approach me and tell me, hey, by the way, you make $10,000 less than everybody else in your job role here. But that's not really the important part. The important part is that after I did my own independent research, I was actually making 30% less than what my market value dictated at the time. So that $10,000 became a distant memory. But here's how other women do nationally when it comes to negotiation. And I should mention ahead of time that the data source that I use for this information is hired.com. They're like an indeed for just tech jobs. And the numbers that they provided here, they did not break that across women of different ethnicities. And I wish that they had. That would have been a much richer data set to show. You can tell I don't work with data. But what they are, I'm just going to show what they offer. So according to Hire.com, white women with four years or less experience asked for more money than their white male counterparts and are getting it. So what can we glean from this? Basically, junior women are not only figuring out what their market value is, not only are they not afraid to ask for that, they're asking for more than that. And they're getting it. Yay across the board, right? This is all positive, positive news. These women are already doing more than what I did during that particular part of my career. But here's the bad news. At six or more years of experience, white women begin asking for less than their white male counterparts, and they're getting that. So what can we glean from this? Somewhere around the midpoint, the mid-career point, women are no longer asking for, they're not being aggressive with their salary negotiation, according to Hire.com. And here's the other thing, which is tragic. No one, if you're gonna sell yourself short, no one is going to correct you on this. And I'm certainly proof of that. Now I have my own speculations on why the negotiation stops over time. But we, we can't get into that right now. We're, we'll have to talk about that during the Q&A. So here are some other ways that a pay gap can begin to open and widen over time. Staying at the same company for two years or more can cause this to happen. Now, why is that? The reason this is is because when you, for every year that you stay at a company, if it's a non-promotion year, you're going to only get a 2 to 3% annual salary increase. You start racking up too many of those, that makes it a great opportunity for your market value to jump up and outpace the 2 to 3% that you're going to get that year. So I do some career coaching now for clients, and my advice is at this point, if you have been at a company for two years and no one has approached you from management about hey, we want you to advance your career here, move on. But even with a promotion, that may not close the gap for you, and here's why. So a, a number of companies have HR policies where they cap how much more you can make after you get a promotion. So let's, and this is what happened to me. And I'm gonna use some theoretical numbers here. Let's say I got a promotion at one job, and let's say that I was in my pre-promotion role making 80K. The post-promotion role, that pay band started at 100K. My expectation was that I would start at 100K post-promotion. However, that is not what happened. 
Once I got the promotion, I was then informed, well, we have an HR policy that says you can't make more than 10% more than what you were making before you got the promotion. So in essence, what that means is that anybody off the street who got hired into that next, the pro post-promotion role, they would be making more than somebody who was at that company a long time, you know, and they would be making a lot more money, <laughs> not just a little more. Now here's the other issue. Let's say that you interviewed at another company and during that interviewing process, the recruiter or hiring manager asked you, hey, how much do you make right now? And you answered honestly. Well, that can turn around to bite you because at the end of the day, if they decide that they want to make you an offer, they're only going to offer you 10 to 15% more than what you said that you are making at that point in time. So my advice to clients is if you are asked that question, don't answer it. Always bring the conversation back to, well, how much are you willing to pay for this position? Because they do have a number in mind. All employers have a budget that they've attached to this position and they know exactly how much they're willing to pay for you to take this role. So it's not an unfair question. Now how do you figure out your market value because that's really where, the, it's the crux of this conversation, right? If you can't figure out your market value then you can't figure out if you have a pay gap. Has anyone here ever calculated their own market value? Raise your hands, please. Oh, that's, that's more than I thought. That's excellent. So I, when I do this kind of research, I like to do, I like to get as many data points as I possibly can across as many data sources as I can. And so this is one data source that you can use, websites, I provided five up here that you can take a look at. But in all honesty, I don't love websites as a data source for this kind of research. This is just to kind of get your feet wet and get you understanding that, you know, what kind of research you can do. And it's really the easiest way to get some numbers. The reason I don't love websites is because they don't take into account the one factor that affects your pay the most, which is your skill set. How in demand your skill set really is. And so again, this gets you your foot in the door so you can see some numbers, but it's not the end all be all data source in my opinion. Now recruiters, in my opinion, this will get you closest to what you're looking for as far as market value goes. But before you start talking to recruiters, and by recruiters I don't mean the kind of recruiters that only place people at one company, I mean the kind of recruiters that place contractors at various companies in the area. These are the folks you want to key in on. But before you talk to them, what I would say is you need to understand a little bit of their lingo, and they don't speak in annual salary, which is something that full-time employees are used to speaking in. They talk an hourly rate. So I use this handy-dandy calculator or f formula to do some quick math in my head to understand what kind of money we're really talking about when I'm talking to a recruiter. So for example, if a recruiter came to you and said, hey, I have this great position, contract role, let's say it's a 12-month contract, it pays $50 an hour. Well, 50 times 2,000 is 100,000. So roughly, you kind of get an idea there of what you, we're talking about as far as annual salary goes, except that you're not taking into account benefits. And that's a little bit trickier to take that into account, but we can, if anyone has questions about that, we can probably get into that during the Q&A. Or you can meet up with me after the talk. It's a long conversation, so maybe after the talk is better. And I should mention that you don't want to just talk to any recruiter you want to talk to the right recruiter. I actually brought my right recruiter <laughs> up here in the front. But the right recruiter tends to have 10 years or more experience as a staffing recruiter. And the reason you want to pick somebody that has that amount of experience is because the unscrupulous recruiters, or the wrong recruiter, as I call them, they tend to wash out after, I don't know, four or five years. This is what I've been told by, other, by the right recruiter, is that 
This is why you want to avoid those. The other thing, the reason that I'm having you talk to the right recruiter, though, is because they are very transparent when it comes to hourly rates for jobs. So I can hand my resume to the right recruiter, and this person can scan my skill set, and after you know, a reasonable amount of time, they'll get back to me and say, hey, you can make X number of dollars an hour based on your skill set. And guess what? The wrong recruiter is not going to be that upfront with you about how much you can make. What they're going to do is they're going to turn around and say, well, how much do you want to make? And they're going to try to get you to lowball yourself so that they get to keep more of the money that they get paid by the client. Now, friends, I'm not going to lie. This is a little bit controversial of a topic. Using your friends as a data source for your market value research. So a lot of folks tend to feel very uncomfortable talking to people that they know about pay, whether it's their pay or the other person's pay. But I'm going to encourage you to try to be comfortable with being uncomfortable with this. Only because it turns out that when there's salary transparency in an organization, people are less likely to have pay gaps. And that's kind of a big deal. However, I'm going to caution everyone because there are employers where you are not allowed to ask those kinds of questions or have those kind of conversations in the workplace especially. And I know people that have told me that they've seen people get fired just for having that conversation. So look in your employee handbook. That's where all the dirty secrets are. <laughs> Go to die. And make sure that there's no policy against that before you start having this conversation. Or maybe you just have those conversations over drinks instead of having them in the workplace. So that's asking friends. Now, there's another technique here where you can ask someone one rung up from you. And so if you're an individual contributor, you would ask a manager, how much would somebody like me get paid in your organization, in your, on your team, essentially. And a lot of folks are a lot more comfortable having that conversation rather than having the conversation of how much they make. But that is definitely one technique that you can use. And I would actually recommend using all of these just so you gather as much data as possible. Now, the obvious question here is why can't I go talk to my own manager? And, and you can. I'm certainly giving you permission to try that. But I want you to keep in mind that in some organizations, it is not encouraged for managers to openly have this conversation. And certainly, you may be at one and not realize it. Go ask, but just realize that you may not get an answer. Now, if you don't have someone one rung up above you in your network, and you need, a, you need a, to strengthen your network, essentially, you can come to me. I can, I can, I'm more than happy to share my network with you. I'm on LinkedIn, like everybody else here, I'm sure. And I'm more than happy to help point you out to somebody, especially if you're in the Austin area or if you're from the South Florida area. Those are the two places where I can help you. I can't help you anywhere else, unfortunately. Now, for our allies in the room, I'm talking about the folks that are not part of an underrepresented group in tech that are here today. Here's what you can do to help. If you, I'm going to request that you take aside some of your underrepresented in tech friends and just, especially if they're in a role that's the same as yours or similar to yours, and I'm going to ask that you share your salary with them. I've had this done for me, and it was eye-opening, very educational to find this out. So this is how you can help. Now, you, at this point, you've done your market value research. You have discovered that you have a pay gap. So the obvious question now is, how do you close it? Can you close it where you're at? So you answer this question by approaching HR or your management, whatever the policy is at your workplace, and you say to them something similar to the following. I've done some market value research. 
I've discovered that my market value far exceeds my pay, who do I talk to about getting a market adjustment? And those are the magic words, market adjustment. You don't want to talk about how many raises am I going to need to get there? You don't want to get into how many, you know, am I going to need to get a promotion to get to the salary that I'm supposed to be at? Market adjustment. Now, it's possible that this conversation does not go your way. And you might end up having to consider going elsewhere. Now, you could get another full-time position. However, I am going to ask that you consider contracting. Now, this is what closed the pay gap for me, and it was in one fell swoop. I'm pretty sure that it could do that for others as well. And I threw in some salary negotiation scenarios just to kind of round things off a little bit. So let's say we're going to continue with our current scenario where we have asked for a market adjustment. Let's say your current employer was not willing to give that to you. So now you've gone on a stealth job search and you found a company that you really hit it off with and they really love you and they gave you an offer and now it's time to consider money. And they've given you your first salary offer. Let's say, for example, that this salary offer actually exceeds what you figured out as your market value. You're going to get really excited, and it's, it's a very emotional time. You're going to be very tempted to say, yes. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you to hold back. Hit the pause button, take a deep breath, and say the following magical words. How much time do I have to think this over? Now, it's, I would not accept anything less than 24 hours to think something like this over. But if you're lucky and this conversation took place on a Friday, you're going to get the weekend to think about this. And that's a good situation to be in. Now, here's why I'm not telling you to go ahead and take this, even though you've done all the work of figuring out what your market value is and everything. The reason I'm going to tell you not to take this is because when employers offer you, make their initial salary offer, they know that their cap for this is way up here somewhere. And they're expecting you to come back and counter offer them for more than what they initially offer you. So they're not going to start at the cap. They're going to come down here somewhere. They're going to take a certain percentage off and they're going to initially offer you something down here because they're expecting you to negotiate for more and they want some room to be able to negotiate with without hitting that cap. So they're expecting you to negotiate. So when we just take that first offer, has anybody who here has taken the first offer given to them? And, I, and I'm guilty of the same, so I, I can't, I'm not over here scolding anybody. <laughs> but the truth is it happens. But they're not expecting you to do that. They're actually expecting you to go up from there. So they're a little, they're lowballing you just a little bit just to give themselves some room to play with when you counter offer them. So this is why you, you want to counter offer, always. Never take the first offer. And again, you know, the objective here isn't to just beat your market value. You could have incorrectly calculated that, by the way. The point here is to make as much or more than your future peers at your future job. And so that's really the point of, of what you're trying to do, and that's why you want to take a little time to detach emotionally and concentrate on coming up with a really good counter offer. So let's say you went through that whole process, you knocked it out of the park, you got some the money that you wanted from these folks, they're happy, you're happy. Now it's time to turn in your two weeks notice at your current employer. Let's say, for example, that your current employer suddenly has a change of heart. And this has happened to me. Let's say that they went from, we're not going to talk to you about your market adjustment to, 
baby, 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 you know what? I really love you. I needed you this whole time. I just didn't know. But now that you're leaving me, I want you back. Let me put on some Teddy Pendergrass and, you know, talk about it. And your, your instinct, because I know at the time, my instinct was just to shut it down and be like, you know what? Hell to the no. I'm not dealing with this. I've already dealt with you. We're done. I'm moving on. I've already found somebody else. You know, I don't need this. But what I'm going to ask you to do is, again, hit the pause button, take a deep breath, and say the following magical words. How much time do I have to think this over? Because you're really, this is a magical negotiation opportunity. You have lots of leverage in this situation. And this could be, at the very least, a good time for you to practice your negotiation skills. So I want you to go, at, at that point in time, once they give you some time to think about it, I want you to go home. I want you to open a bottle of wine, eat a big thing of cookie dough, whatever it is that you do to relax, play some Mario Kart, I don't know. And once you're relaxed, I want you to then think about what's it going to take for me to be happy here? And then I want you to quantify that. Now, it could be that you're just so done with this place that it's going to take a million dollars a year, right, for you to want to stick around. But if, it's, if you can think of a number that's more down to earth, let's say you came up with, okay, 160 k That's what it's going to take for me to be happy. 160 k base salary a year. Then once you've come up with that number, what I want you to do is come up with three of what I call alternative bargaining chips. These are things that come out of a different budget, but they have monetary value. So, and I know that you can negotiate for things like sign-on bonuses and extra vacation and things like that, but the things that I'm mentioning, that I'm going to mention to you right now, are actually bargaining chips that will allow you, that will help you to increase your market value in the end. So the three things that I advocate using as chips are company paid training, company paid conferences, and career coaching. Because if you've ever priced out career coaching, it's $250 an hour for a lot of career coaches. Again, these are all things that should increase your market value in the end. You want to attach monetary values to this, and you should write down some notes so that when you actually go in to do your counteroffer, whether it's over the phone or in person, a lot of those sessions tend to be somewhat full of excitement and you may forget some of these price tags that you've attached to these things. This, these are things that I advocate for you to do before you walk back in to do your counteroffer. Now, speaking of increasing your market value, the best thing that you can do to increase your market value is really to acquire in-demand or hot skills. That's the quickest way for you to increase your market value. And how do I look up what skills I think are going to increase my market value? I use job sites. So the, the roles that I have done in the past or are similar roles to mine, I will look them up and I will look at the job descriptions. And again, I'm gathering as many data points as I can, and I am looking at, is there a trend? Is there something that I keep seeing pop up in different job descriptions? And then what I do is I talk to recruiters. The right recruiter, again, and I've had phone calls where I'll say, hey, I'm thinking of picking up XYZ skill set. How much money can I make doing that? And they'll tell you right up front, you can make X dollars an hour doing that particular skill set. And at that point, I can make the decision, is this going to be, give me the return on investment that I need to have? Because these are things that usually are, you're devoting time and effort outside of your current day job in order to pick up these skills. So you want to make sure you're going to get your return on investment on that. And here I'm going to show this just to give you a little taste of the power of certification. How many of you, are, how many of you here have certifications right now? 
Very good. So those of you that have not considered it yet, I'm hoping that this will persuade you. But definitely this is the kind of thing that you want to be looking at when you're considering which certifications to pick up. And so we're at the end of the talk. At the beginning of the talk, I said that I was not into salary negotiation. I didn't really think about it and talk about it. Nowadays, this is pretty much a lot of what I talk about and think about and read about. <laughs> and so hopefully this will give you some ideas on how you can increase your skills in salary negotiation because I do believe that it is a skill. In fact, there's a really nice little tip that I got from someone recently where basically she said, since negotiation is a skill like any other, the unfortunate part about salary negotiation is that we only practice it one time a year around review time for really high stakes. How are we ever going to get better at this if there's all this pressure and there's not that much practice involved? So her suggestion was take everyday opportunities to increase your salary negotiation skill. And how do you do this? You can go and try to negotiate for things at the grocery store, for example. You can negotiate for a price or cheap, uh, cheaper price on gas. I've done this, so it is possible. And so these are ways that you can practice your skills so you can get better at it. And finally, I'd like to ask that all of you take the tactics that you like the most from this talk and strategies and take aside three of your underrepresented in tech friends and show them these tactics that you like the most and try to help them to close, discover and close any pay gaps that they may have. Thank you. Time for maybe a question or two. Hi, my name's Chris. I came in about halfway through your talk, uh, but I really liked what I heard. I hope I'm not gonna say anything or, or ask a question for something you already went over. But um, I'm recently going through, I'm lo looking for a job right now and I've been um, doing a lot of negotiation for about the past two months and I've done this a lot in my career. And a couple things I found that really work well is, as you said, finding your market value and the trick is finding your market value, getting yourself into the higher standard deviation of it, because there's always a range in the bell curve, place yourself in that higher st standard deviation, and then be firm there. Um, I've heard lots of companies, I'll send out my rate, whether it's for a contractor salary, counting all the benefits into that too, and they'll say, nah, we can't do that, it's too high, can you come down? Like, nope, that's my rate, let me know when you can. <laughs> I almost always hear right back, okay, we'll call you in. So um, like that's, that. It's the same negotiation tactic I use for like buying a car too. Go in know, knowing, doing your research, knowing what the price is. Right. And, bec and because you came in and did all that research and know what you're worth and know what you're willing to take, if you get that, you're happy. And if you're in that higher standard devi deviation based on what the market is paying, you know you're already gonna be coming in above most, pe at least most of the people that are at the company. So if it fits in with what you were saying, you wanna be paid more than the people that are already there. When you're paid more, it's like the, the water that raises all the ships, right? If you're paid more, now other people in the industry can be paid more too, so then that means the next time you go to get a job, you can get more as well. So that's my main advice is be confident in that number, make it on the higher end. Even if you don't think you're worth it, everyone has that, it's part of that imposter syndrome, you are worth it, know your skills, and just stick to it. And I've never had it not work for me, so. Well, yeah, if you've, if you've done your research and the way that I've laid out for you to do it, you've have, you have plenty of backup to support the fact that you do deserve the amount that you are asking for. And so I've had folks come to me and say, well, but people are negotiating for money that they're not even, they shouldn't be making. And I said, and that's not the way that I advocate doing it. By the way, the way that I do it is you're going to have plenty of backup and evidence to show this is what you're worth. Hi, Giselle. Thank Hi. you so much for the talk. Um, sure. So I think one of your slides, you touched briefly on it. If you're at the same company, your, your chances of getting your, 
your market-based value pay is very, it sounds like what you're saying is it's not good, right? Is there's, there's no strategy, Can do you know of any strategy to stay within the company? Like what if, you know, I'm happy at my, my the current organization I'm in for a number of reasons, right? but the pay is probably not, I don't know. So I think that depends on how, what, how big the gap is. And also what I have found is that it is a little more difficult to jump up and pay where you are. Think of it as a relationship that, I hope I don't get in trouble for this. Think of it as a romantic relationship that's been going on for a long time. You both start to kind of take each other for granted, right? Well, that's kind of how it is for your employer as well. They have you there, they're used to your great work ethic, and they're used to you getting the results that they need, and being a great team player. And they start to think, well, this is kind of what I deserve. And when you start asking for more in return, it might get met with a little bit of resistance for that reason. Now, I have seen folks once again, that scenario will come up where if they go somewhere else, it's possible that it is at that point in time that your employer realizes, hey, you know what? I really want this person to stick around. They're a great employee. We need to keep this person. And that's when they'll be willing, more willing, to jump up and pay you more at that point in time. I'm not saying that you should pretend that you're getting another job and come up with like a fake salary offer from somebody else in order to uh, negotiate more with your current employer. I'm not advocating that. But just realize that you may have to be willing to walk away to get the pay that you deserve. Uh, thanks again for the, the speech, wonderful speech. And I, I, I've been in the situation where I stayed in a, a company for lower pay and I knew it. And, um, and I've hired a lot of people who've done the same thing I did to the, my next next uh, employer where I did not divulge my current salary. I said, my skills are this, and this is what it's worth, and I'm not talking about my previous salary. And I've never had a problem with that. And I never had someone who I hired had a problem with that. So, yeah, I mean, if you're happy in your current place, but you're not getting you know paid enough, and there's other stuff in your life, I, I, I think that's fine, right? But you know, your next next gig, get paid what you're worth, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks again, Gazelle. Thank you. Thank All you, right. everyone. Show of hands. Thank you, Gazelle.